One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that Paul the Apostle said would grow in the life of genuine Spirit-filled believers is gentleness. Gentleness has nothing to do with size, strength, or gender. It's a condition of the heart. I have often heard it defined as strength under control, and we'll get to that later. Gentleness is not weakness, but is often just great strength inhabited by last week's fruit of the Holy Spirit, self-control. This was the context of the old world term, gentleman. A gentleman was a man with power and wealth who was humble and treated people well. That term, gentleman, like so many others in our inverted and perverted culture, has been co-opted by the dark side. Nowadays, the term gentleman is often applied to those seedy nightclubs where women dance without their clothes on. Very few men today understand the old definition. Are there any true gentlemen left? Or has the world been taken over by the Rambos, the Terminators, and the Jason Bournes? It would appear that gentlemen are out of vogue today, and so is gentleness. But as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we who follow the gentle shepherd are called to walk a different path. The name of this message is Gentleness, the Velvet Hammer. And even though many may see gentleness as weakness. The Bible teaches the opposite. Look at the verses from Proverbs at the top of your note sheets today. They teach us that one can accomplish great work and unleash awesome power with gentleness. Proverbs 15.1 and 25.15. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle tongue can break a bone. Like a velvet hammer, gentleness can often knock out anger. Gentleness can break the backbone of denial and lying and bitterness. One need not be macho and mean to get the things done in the kingdom that Jesus wants us to get done. This fruit of the Spirit called gentleness can accomplish great victories in the lives of believers. Perhaps that's why first today, A, gentleness is of great worth in God's eyes. Great worth. 1 Peter 3, 3-4 through says it this way. Your beauty should, not, should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter, 1 Peter 3, and you'll understand where this comes from. I know that this may be hard for some of you to believe, but I wasn't always the clean-cut, well-balanced, nice guy that you see before you today. I was once a chronic and a crude drunk, self-centered, user of people, with only sporadic self-control, just enough to make me think I still had it. I wasn't that way all day, every day, but I lived that life enough that my friends on the dark side called me Space Cowboy. In those days, my slogan was, it's all about me. One thing changed to get me here today. Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sins, and I decided to follow Him. When I was finally convinced 
what kind of man I really was. I cried out to God, just like Jeff talked about this morning, and Jesus saved me. Not because I deserved it at all, but because of His persistent and gentle mercy. He can do that for you today if you will cry out to Him. And Jesus not only saved me, but He changed me. They go together. You cannot have one without the other. They are inseparable, salvation and change. But how did I find out about that persistent and gentle mercy? Not through some hellfire and damnation preacher on TV, although I believe in hellfire and damnation. Not through the reading of the Bible. I didn't even have one, although I believe in the transforming power of the written word, and I've seen Scripture lead people to Jesus, but that wasn't my case. No. I find out about Jesus through the persistent and gentle mercy of a believing wife, a Christian wife, who literally lived 1 Peter 3 in front of my eyes, like Steve Kometz lived the gospel in front of Jeff's eyes. The velvet hammer of gentleness is what struck me down. It also knocked some sense into my head. It broke the back of sin in my life. Not to say that I've never sinned since, but it does not control me now. It crushed the bones of my rebellion and extinguished my wrath. It opened my eyes to my addictions. It healed my heart. It melted my defenses as Jesus gently drew me to himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the love of a Christian woman who actually lived out her faith in my presence. She was the gospel. She didn't preach it to me. She lived it. Christians, and I'm speaking to both men and women, our strength and our beauty should not be about our physique or our stature or our wardrobe or our wealth. It should come from the unfading beauty of our gentle spirits. The beauty that draws others should come from the inside out, not be on the outside of us. This gentleness can win souls. I'm here to testify to that. And so you see, B, gentleness is an inner attitude expressed in outward action toward people and situations. It expresses itself. And this truth comes from Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness is a fruit to be displayed. That's why God lets us grow it. Our gentleness is to be evident. The flip side of this truth is that gentleness, which is not evident or not seen in some way, is not true godly gentleness. For gentleness is more than just an inner attitude. It starts with an inner attitude a fruit that is rooted in the Holy Spirit of God who comes to live in us at salvation, but it is expressed as an outward action or it is not gentleness. But there is an unpleasant catch with gentleness. It can only be actively expressed with people and with situations that test our gentleness. In other words, Gentleness is not real gentleness unless there is an occasion for it. And the possibility of the opposite expression, which would be wrath or anger, something like that. So our gentleness level can only be confirmed and tested by people and situations where it is difficult to be gentle. This is true of every one of the fruits of the Spirit. Consider the fruit love. That's the very number one that's mentioned in Galatians. When Jesus was teaching about love, he said, and this is a paraphrase, so you love those that love you back? 
<laughs> so what? Big deal. Even the pagans who don't believe in our God at all do that. But when you call yourself by my name, you love those who don't love you back. Even your enemies. Then you are loving with divine love, the fruit of my Holy Spirit. And so it is with gentleness. The Lord says, let your gentleness be evident to all. It is to be conspicuous to everyone. If we look in the Bible and we find a variety of people and situations where God calls us to let our gentleness show, and we're going to look at a few of those. First, there is gentleness toward believers. That's number one there today comes out of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 be completely humble and gentle be patient bearing with one another in love now Paul is writing to the church here to believers and every one of us here today can probably relate to an incident where we were treated with less than gentleness by someone who called themselves a Christian sometimes the treatment people receive from Christians is not gentle but mean-spirited, hostile, destructive. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. And do not participate in that. We are called to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, and gentle. We should display these spiritual fruits, especially in our church family. We are called to bear with one another. Because frankly, you're not perfect. Neither am I. We are called to be gentle with our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Number two, gentleness toward those who sin. Galatians 6 1 says it this way If someone you know is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Get that word. Hebrews 5.2 echoes this. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. People who are caught in sin are not to be restored by cutting their heads off or cut off like some cancerous growth. You're out. They are to be brought to repentance and restored. They are to be divinely healed with a divine love and with gentleness. And God calls us to be His healing agents. Those who are truly spiritual are called to gently restore the sinner. And listen, everybody won't like this. We have done that in the past here at this church, and people have left because they thought we ought to cut their head off, maybe. At least we ought to throw them out of the church. Now, this does not exclude firm and decisive corrective action. It doesn't preclude that there are consequences for sin. But it does exclude a punitive attitude on our part. We are told to deal gently with those who have gone astray. Why? Because it's God's way. It's the way of Jesus. It is the way that God has dealt with each of us, or we wouldn't be here. We would be soot. We who have experienced God's mercy and grace should, of all people, be willing to show it to others, for we are sinners saved by grace, every one of us, and God has been gentle with you. I read a short story recently about the famous evangelist Billy Sunday. Man, he was... He drew big crowds back in the day. And it seems that Billy Sunday was getting ready to hold meetings in a large U.S. city, and he wrote a letter to the mayor. And in that letter, he requested the names of individuals that the mayor might know who had spiritual problems and might need a special kind of prayer. A few days later, Billy Sunday was surprised when this package came in from the mayor's office, a heavy package that contained the city's huge phone directory. The mayor had correctly assumed that everyone who lived in his city was a candidate for spiritual help, and his name was in the book too. 
Billy Sunday learned a very important spiritual lesson that day, one he never forgot. If we can grasp this truth, it will help us to display the kind of gentleness that should be evident to sinners because, you see, our names are in the phone book. Don't get smart and say, well, I got a cell phone now. (laughs) That might be part of your problem, my friend. And by the way, a whole lot of people got your phone number. I'll guarantee it. There's another group that needs gentleness. Third, gentleness towards seekers. Sometimes people realize that something is missing in their life and that they need something more. And so they come looking for Jesus. They, They may see something in our lives, hopefully, or hear something in our church advertising on the radio that draws them toward here or really toward God. And what we may see in their lives are all the things that need to get straightened out. For these occasions, we need gentleness. The Lord says it well in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. People who are seeking God need to see and hear and feel the love of Jesus. And you might be the only one they know that has that to offer them. What will they get? They don't need to be dangled over hell and told they are worthless sinners. Most genuine seekers already know that. They sense that. We must speak the truth but we must speak it in love. And fourth, gentleness towards subversives. Now, this may be the hardest one for us. The Scriptures teach that we should deal gently even with those who oppose us. It it is in most of us to fight when we meet a dangerous obstacle or person, especially one that appears hostile. And fighting is always an option. But as our gentleness, as God's gentleness of His Holy Spirit grows in us, it will decrease our tendency for fighting to be the first option. We will grow in grace when dealing with opponents, even people that we think are heretics, maybe. We will grow in grace and begin to proceed with gentleness instead of hostility. And listen, if we stand for anything at all, we will have opponents. Maybe the one reason you can't think of any, because you really don't stand for much in your circles. I came across this short folk proverb recently, The Lord gives us friends to push us to our potential and enemies to push us beyond it. I like that. Well, I don't like it, but I I think it's true. Maybe our prayer should be like this note written to a, a pastor from a small child in his congregation. She wrote, Dear Pastor, I heard you say to love our enemies. I'm only six, and I don't have any yet. I hope I have some when I'm seven. (laughs) Your friend, love, Amy. We are called to grow gentleness in our lives and then to display it even to those who oppose us. And now listen, this is not something you're going to do by grit and clenched hands. This is going to be something that happens as the Spirit of God continues to grow and blossom inside of you and to replace the old nature with a new one. Gentleness has uh, several models in Scripture, things that we can look at and say, oh, yeah, that's what gentleness looks like. Number one, gentle like a shepherd. (laughs) We talked about this across the hall today in cross-training. 
Isaiah 40, 11 speaks prophetically of Jesus, and it says, He leads his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. Listen to this. He gently leads those who have young. The shepherd is one of the models often used by God to teach us about himself. The shepherd was a rugged but caring individual. He was tough, but he showed love toward his flock. The shepherd watched over that flock by day and by night. A good shepherd did not beat the sheep that strayed. He went out and rescued them from the trouble that they were in. The shepherd would then gently carry or lead them back to the flock. That was his job. You see, the shepherd is not interested in retribution, but reunion. The shepherd's purpose is not so much about control as it is caring. His goal is not punishment, but protection. And listen, it will take more than just knowing what the shepherd is like to make us gentle. I heard about a a famous actor who was at a dinner party. And while he was there, he was begged by the guests to recite selections from his famous literary works. He was an orator as well. And an old preacher was there, and the old preacher said, well, hey, how about you recite the 23rd Psalm? I know you know it. And the Lord is my shepherd. You know that one. And the actor agreed. He said, yes, I know that, but only on one condition, that the old preacher would also recite the psalm after the actor was finished. So the actor's recitation was beautifully intoned with great dramatic emphasis And he received lengthy applause. (laughs) The people loved it. The preacher's presentation revealed his rough voice. And his, his diction wasn't perfect. But when he finished, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And someone asked the actor, what, what made the two recitations so different? And, and the actor wisely noted, he said, I know the psalm, but that preacher, he knows the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd? Really? Or do you know some of the rules he laid down? Not the same. It will take more than just knowing what the shepherd is like to make us gentle. You can read that gospel through. You can imitate Jesus all you want. But until he leads your life inside of you, you won't be gentle. If gentleness is to grow in our lives, it will require that we not only look to the shepherd as a model, but that we truly know the shepherd. The shepherd is Jesus. Do you know Jesus? There's a second model from Scripture, gentle like a mother. Comes from 1 Thessalonians 2 7. We were gentle among you like a mother caring for her young. In the animal world, mothers are a picture of gentle caring. They not only give birth, but they clean. They feed, they protect their young. They are a picture of gentleness as they watch over their babies. Only in this human world that we live in is this great maternal drive so many times interrupted or abandoned. And though it is rare, it is almost always the result of sin of some kind. Few things are more powerful than a mother's love. Susanna Wesley, mother of John and Charles Wesley, two great men in the church, had 11 children. That in itself shows that she was a caring person. She was once asked, which one of your children do you love the most? Oh, man. She gently replied, I love the one who's sick until he gets well and the one who's always away until he comes home. That's a good model of gentleness that you find in a mother. And it can be appropriated with any of us by God. 
And I would say it is being appropriated and has been. A third model, gentle like Jesus. This God-man who could heal the sick, raise the dead, walk on water, calm raging storms with a word, this man was gentle. This man who spoke the world into existence and who could easily speak it out of existence. He was gentle. These words were prophesied about him and fulfilled on what we call Palm Sunday. See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. (laughs) This God-man Jesus calls each of us in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30 calls us. Listen to him. He's calling you now. Listen. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is a gentle Savior. Learn about Him. Come to truly know Him, not just know about Him. Follow Him. Let Him capture your heart and change your life. Grow more and more like Him each day. Let His fruit grow in your life. Use Him as the supreme example of what men and women should be like. Grow in godly gentleness. Fourth, gentle like God the Father. 1 Kings 19.12 speaks of our God and it says this, After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And the scripture goes on to say, the Lord was in the the whisper. God, whose voice can shake the foundations of the earth, can send fire down from heaven, chooses to come to Elijah in a gentle whisper. The psalm writer says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Can you hear the Lord whispering? What is God saying to you today? Do you know why our world has become so noisy? It's not an accident. It's not just scientific progress. It's so that you and I cannot hear God whispering to us unless we find ways to shut out that noise. This is likely one of the reasons that God did not want His people to gather in large cities. They're noisy. But He told them to spread out and to fill the earth. He doesn't want to have to shout at us. He wants us to hear His gentle whisper. He is gently reminding you of things today. Is He reminding you of some sin in your life? Is Jesus gently calling you to surrender and give Him your full allegiance all of your life, to quit living that double life? Can you hear Him whispering now? Is the Holy Spirit gently leading you to weed out some of the things in your garden that are choking His fruit? He's trying to grow in your life. Is God calling you today? Listen for His whisper. And know this. God could take everything by force if He so desired. One day... This rebellious world will see that side of God. But now, in this age of grace, God is gently calling those who are His own. Like God spoke to Adam, He says, Where are you? I'm looking for you. I'm watching for you. I will come for you if I must, but come home if you can find your way. That way home is Jesus. You follow Him, and He will get you home safely. He is the shepherd. 
we are his sheep. And so although the Lord is strong and mighty, he will gently woo us because D today. Gentleness is indeed strength under control. The Lord of the universe, the creator of all things that have ever been, that now are, and ever will be, this Lord who is mighty in power and able to do all things, this Lord is gentle. For our Lord has strength that is under control. If it weren't, again, we would not be here. God is our model for gentleness. Is Jesus your model? That's a yes or no answer. Do you know the shepherd personally? That's a yes or no answer. Is gentleness growing in your life because Jesus lives in your life? That's a yes or no answer. Maybe it's time to let him in. Allow the velvet hammer of God's gentleness to drive a stake of love and grace deep into your heart. Let gentleness grow in your life. Let's, um, let's recite our memory verse for this series. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit, say it with me, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Do you need more of those qualities in your life? What you really need is Jesus. Repent of your sins. Cry out to God for forgiveness. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Vow that you will follow Him. Frankly, because the road you are on now leads to nowhere without Jesus. Come to know the shepherd today. Right here. Right now. In this room. Let Jesus come into your life and take it over. Today is the day of salvation. Come. And be filled with God's Spirit today. Part of that being gentleness. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we are humbled by your grace and mercy. We are humbled by the fact that you would give us this grace period in our lives where we can choose to be filled with you and allow your Spirit to begin to grow in our lives. We thank you for that opportunity. I pray that every person in this room will take that opportunity and say yes to you and be filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you need Jesus today? Do you need him in your life? Do you need him to come and fill you with the Holy Spirit? If so, just step out from where you are and come and stand. It's a step of obedience. God calls you to do something and you say yes. That's the first step. Is this your day?